Good morning, everyone. Very happy to see you all here. My name's Keegan. And while I appear before you today a, a fairly healthy young person, I know that one day, hopefully in the far off future, I won't be anymore. And then I'm going to become patient Alpha 2619 at Alcor Life Extension Foundation in Arizona, where I will have been cryopreserved, awaiting future repair and revival. That's right, you heard me correctly. I'm getting frozen when I die, and so can all of you. <laughs> and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Because if you're anything like I was uh, seven years ago when I first heard about cryonics, you might be going, what? Really? He's doing this? This is actually going on? I mean, everybody knows that Walt Disney was cryopreserved and he currently lives underneath Pirates of the Caribbean in Disneyland. <laughs> Except that he doesn't. That's a pesky urban myth. But the truth is, it is very real. And it's something that any of you can do, well, not today, but hopefully someday far in the future when you're very ill and you need it. And it has been available to you for quite some time, even if you weren't aware of it. In fact, this year is the 50th year anniversary since the cryopreservation of the first person to undergo the procedure, Dr. James Bedford, you can see on the upper left there. And then you can see him getting transferred into his new digs at Alcor Life Extension Foundation in 1991. But if we wanted to trace the history of this all the way back, we'd actually end up with this handsome fellow here, Ben Franklin who far before his time had the idea that maybe someday science would be able to preserve a person somehow so that future advancements in science and medicine would be able to do something about their condition. But he realized that in his time, science was still too near its infancy for him to expect to see something like that within his lifetime. And so it wasn't until another 200 years went by until this fellow came on the scene, Robert Ettinger, who was the first person to formulate the idea of using sub-zero temperatures to stabilize critically ill persons for future repair and revival. And notice again, I didn't say freezing people. And that's because freezing people does a huge disservice to both the science and also the whole objective. In the first place, because well, we know what happens when we freeze tissues. It's not good. Uh, and we're trying our absolute best to avoid freezing and introducing any ice crystal formation into the system. But the other part of it, dead people, is also a huge misnomer. Because if cryonics works, we won't be raising the dead. We'll be redefining what death meant in the first place. And it won't be the first time, either. And that's the first major mind warp that I think people need to go through in order to really fully understand what cryonics is trying to do, is that life and death aren't these binary concepts that we're used to thinking them of, uh, on or off, alive or dead. Dying is a process that takes time, and it's a process that we're getting better and better at interrupting and reversing over time. And so before the advent of CPR and electric defibrillation, all you needed to know in order to determine whether or not somebody was alive or dead was whether their heart was beating. But then we figured out how to restart stopped hearts. So we had to move our definition of death further down the road. And cryonics assumes that this is a, a process that will continue into the future and that somewhere down the road, states that are today considered dead will no longer be considered dead. The problem is, how do we get the patients of today into the hospitals of tomorrow? And that's where low temperature comes in. Because we've known for some time that cold temperature has a protective effect on the dying brain. We know this because occasionally, sadly, children will fall through the ice into icy cold waters, but sometimes they manage to survive surprisingly long times down there with no air, no heartbeat, and upon recovery, no measurable brain activity. But if we warm them up and resuscitate them, they can come back and go on to live normal, healthy lives after having been down there for as long as an hour. And the reason that can happen on occasion is fairly simple biochemistry. Low temperature means low energy, which means low reaction rates, which means slower dying process at a biochemical cellular level. 
And we use this today in modern medicine to reduce the occurrence of brain damage and stroke victims and during some very invasive surgeries where we effectively cool down the brain in order to buy time. But you'd be right in saying we don't just freeze people in the hospital. We don't, because like I said, those ice crystals forming in tissue would be hugely damaging. Since the very beginning of cryonics, we've known about substances called cryoprotectants, which reduce the formation of ice in biological tissues below the freezing point of water. Even Dr. James Bedford, the very first man to be cryopreserved, got the benefit of some early cryoprotectant in his system. But a lot of time has passed since then. And very importantly, around the turn of the millennium, we developed a way of combining different sorts of more advanced cryoprotectants in different proportions, very carefully introduced at a very slow cooling rate, in such a way that we can vitrify the tissues, making it into a glassy solid without the formation of any ice. So what you see here on the left is just a straight frozen rabbit kidney. And it looks more or less the way you might expect it to if you left it in the freezer for too long, or if you happen to have a freezer that goes down to negative 140 degrees. On the right, however, is a vitrified rabbit kidney, looking, well, pretty fresh. And in fact, in a later experiment, a rabbit kidney, not unlike the one on the right, was successfully re-implanted into the rabbit that it was borrowed from, and the rabbit went on to live a healthy life happy life, surviving just on that one previously vitrified kidney. So that's certainly progress. But I know what you're thinking. I'm not a rabbit kidney any more than I am a frog. I'm, well, I'm my brain at the very least. So what happens when we do this with brains? Well, this on the left is a control sample of a rat hippocampal brain slice. So the hippocampus is the region of the brain involved in the formation of long-term memories, so obviously very important to personal identity for humans, if not for rats. And on the upper right, we see what happens if you just straight freeze it. No cryoprotection. And it's a mess. We wouldn't expect that to be working anytime soon. But on the bottom right is what happens if you vitrify it instead. And it looks very similar to the control sample. But if we look even closer, closer than we can see here, we're able to assess that the, the potassium and sodium ions on either side of the cell membrane are roughly what they ought to be to infer that the ion channels are still functioning, which are very necessary in order for nerve cells to transmit nervous signals. So we're definitely getting closer here. And while neither of these studies is proof that for sure cryonics will work, they're definitely pointing us in the right direction. They're telling us that we're getting closer. Again, how does this apply to me, right? I'm a, real, I'm a human being. I'm not a brain slice. How are you going to do this to me? Well, the first thing is, is that if you are interested, you, you've got to sign up now as opposed to later. This is not the kind of thing that you want to try and prepare in a hurry once you've already gotten some terminal diagnosis. But furthermore, the younger you are when you sign up, the easier it is to pay for it because you can just get a life insurance policy while it's still cheap, while you're young and healthy, and pay for it a little bit at a time over the rest of your life. So it's really not an inconvenience to you. But then, hopefully a long time from now, when you do get some bad news, well, you've got to let your cryonics organization like Alcor Life Extension Foundation know, or better yet, relocate down to a hospice close to their facility so they can be right there waiting for you when today's doctors say, there's nothing more that we can do for you and declare you legally and clinically dead, that's when the cryonics personnel from Alcor will jump to work, at first using techniques that look very similar to today's resuscitation techniques, cardiopulmonary support to keep oxygenated blood flow moving to your brain, uh, introduction of various medications intended to slow the progression of brain damage that would be occurring, and of course, cooling you down using ice in order to buy that time I was talking about earlier. Then you're transported to their facilities, and that's when the real fun begins, because you'll be perfused with those cryoprotectants I was telling you about before, and brought down slowly past the freezing point of water, until eventually you come to rest at negative 196 degrees, the boiling point of liquid nitrogen, and you're moved into long-term patient care, seen there on the right at Alcor. And then, you wait. 
and how long, we don't know. <laughs> and that, I think, is the most interesting, fascinating thing about cryonics, but also the most challenging for many people, is the amount of uncertainty involved. It's an experimental procedure, the second half of which hasn't been designed yet. Now, it's not to say that we don't have ideas. We've got ideas. We're, we're fairly certain that nanotechnology will have a part to play, repairing the physical damage we know that we're introducing during the imperfect cryopreservation process. But then there's also whatever caused you to need to be cryopreserved in the first place, that your original dying process, whether it was cancer or heart disease or something else. But since so many of those diseases are thoroughly wrapped up with the aging process itself, we're going to need to do something about that as well. Nobody would want to come back still trapped in a body that was old and disabled and, and not as healthy and vigorous as they were in their youth. So rejuvenation biotechnology will need to mature as well in order that we can bring people back to their healthy, youthful body. Or maybe we'll just clone you a new one from your own DNA. That might end up being simpler. You know, a simple body transplant. 50 years, I'm sure we'll all be doing it. Or, or maybe we'll get more creative. Maybe some kind of combination of artificial biology and cybernetics, building something hardier, less squishy, less susceptible to breakdown every 90 years or so. The possibilities are endless, and we have all the time in the world to figure it out, to make sure it's the right way out, to make sure it's ethical. So at this point, you're probably either with me or you're not. <laughs> I look at the science, the, not just cryobiology, but the, the, the whole history of science, especially the last 100 years, 50 years, and I come to the conclusion there has to be a chance, some bare probability above zero that this might work. So then do I want to be part of the experiment group or the control sample? We have a very healthy control sample, except they're not so healthy. They're dead, buried, or cremated. So naturally, I want to be part of the experiment. How fascinating. Sure, it's a gamble, but if I win, I live. If I lose, I'm no deader than I was before. Because I look at this as just a purely rational exercise of self-preservation, literally. But, you know, that's because when I was growing up, I wasn't staying up late at night to watch After Dark specials on HBO. I was watching back episodes of Star Trek, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager. And like those visions of the future, I am highly optimistic about the power for science and technology to continue to have a positive impact in our lives. I believe in that better future. And I don't think that it's any coincidence that Dr. James Bedford was cryopreserved only four months after the airing of the first episode of the original series of Star Trek. Because back then, the whole world was whipped up in a frenzied optimism about the power of science and technology and the future, even while they were ticking down the clock on the doomsday clock for the atom bomb to drop. They still were full of that optimism. So where has that optimism gone? Has science failed to live up to its potential? I don't think so. The phone I have in my pocket allows me to access the full repository of all human knowledge across the world. That's more powerful than the computer Gene Roddenberry dreamt up for the original Enterprise. So what's happened? It seems to me like so many people in the world have lapsed into this real crisis of imagination. Some of us have become intellectual hipsters, going looking for bad reasons to challenge great ideas like cryonics and life extension, rejuvenation technology. I don't want to be remembered for quotes like, heavier-than-air flying machines are impossible. Man, I don't want to be remembered for quotes like that. I want to be remembered for daring to dream, to dream about a better future where people live to 120, 200, 300 years old, in the same physical and mental vitality they had when they were 22. But let's not stop there. If we crack suspended animation, cryonics, life extension, rejuvenation technology, it opens up the universe to us, allows us to spread out into the stars, get off our pale blue dot, and probably secure the survival of our species in the process. So I want to be remembered for daring to dream about this. But 
I do still have some fears, some doubt. One thing I fear is, hopefully a long time from now, being cryopreserved, spending some time as patient Alpha 2619 at Alcor, and then being woken up, only to find that nobody that I knew or cared about or loved from today came with me. That's what I fear, and I think it's what a lot of people fear that causes them to go looking for not so great reasons why cryonics couldn't or shouldn't work. But the truth is that fear is only real if we don't all do it. So let's all do it, <laughs> together, so I don't have to wake up alone. <laughs> Dare to dream with me. Thank you. <laughs>